With the recent passing of OJ Simpson, a lot of old interviews, footage of him has been making its rounds. And one of them was an interview that he did with Fox News back in 2006 that never aired. And if it had aired, I think that his life would have had a really different outcome. I really wish that they would have shown this while he was alive or back then when he actually did this interview, because not only is the interview telling, he tells on himself that he actually did commit the crime of unaliving his wife and Ron Goldman, but it also showed how vile and disgusting of a person that OJ Simpson was. He was literally psychotic, a sociopath, and he should not have been allowed to walk the earth as long as he did. If you're new to this channel, my name is Keisha, AKA Color Me Pink, and this is a new Spill the Tea video. Please make sure to thumbs up this video, you guys. It helps with the algorithm. And if you have not subscribed to my channel, please do so now and turn on your notification bell button so you know when my videos drop. Also, if you want the uncut, uncensored version of this video, please make sure to join my Patreon. Everything over there is raw, uncut, and unfiltered, and ad-free, you guys, ad-free. So make sure you join. The link is down below in the description box. Now, let's get into this interview. If you are triggered by anything crime wise, um, schmurder rise, anything of that nature, this is not the video for you. Log off. Um, this is very disturbing to watch. It really honestly is. And he literally goes from talking about the book that he wrote, If I Did It, and the book is based on a hypothetical if he would have committed the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. But in this interview, he goes from speaking hypothetically to first person back and forth and he can't even keep it straight. It's very chilling. This is a bone chilling interview. So be prepared. Let's take a look. Six uninterrupted minutes. OJ puts himself hypothetically at the scene of the crime. Um, the chapter, chapter six is called The Night in Question. Mm -hmm. uh, and you write in the book, now picture this and keep in mind that this is Purely hypothetical. 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 Yes. Why don't you tell me what might have happened on the night of June 12th, 1994? <laughs> and let's just walk yeah, through the night. I, well, first of all, it's, this is very difficult for me to do this. Uh, it was very difficult for me because it's hypothetical. I know and I accept the fact that people are going to feel whatever way they're going to feel. <laughs> you know, uh, they're going to, uh, um, you know, some, uh, whatever, uh, whatever they want to feel. In the book, the hypothetical is... Uh, Charlie. Uh, uh, Paul Charlie. Charlie. <laughs> Uh, this guy, Charlie, shows up, the guy who I had recently become friends with, and uh, I don't know why you had been by Nicole's house, but it told me you wouldn't believe what's going on over there. And uh, and I remember thinking, well, whatever's going on over there has got to stop, right? So we kind of hooked up together, and, uh, you know, I'm kind of broad stroking this. We go over Get into Bronco and go over it. Let, let's just go back and do the details. Where did you I'm park? Let's the detail. You park in, in the hypothetical, go in the alley. Right. You park in the alley. Yeah. And you put on a wool cap and gloves. Uh, in the hypothetical, I put on a cap and gloves. Right. Yeah. And um, you reached under the seat for. Um, a I always kept a knife in the car for the crazies and stuff because you can't travel with them. And I remember Charlie saying, you ain't bringing that. And I didn't, right? But I believe he took it. Charlie took the Yeah. In the book. Yeah. Yes. So the back gate, you go through the back gate. Yes. And it was open or broken or? I don't recall. Okay. I go to the front and I'm looking to see what's going on. Um, 
And I could see that it appears, like Nicole had, fly, I had candles all the time. She really did to keep her overhead down, I think. And music was on, and uh, while I was there, a guy shows up. You know? So Ron Goldman comes in the back gate. Yeah, a, a, a guy that I really didn't recognize. I, I may have seen him around, but I really didn't recognize him to be anyone. And, uh, and he, I, in the mood I was in, I started having words with him. He says to you, I just came by to return a pair of glasses. Judy left them at the restaurant. Yeah, words to that effect, yes. And, and uh, he was I don't know if I believe it or didn't believe it. Uh, it was pretty much immaterial because, you know, uh, I was more concerned about everything that, that everything that was going on, you know, and uh, was uh, fed up with it, I guess. And uh, You get into a fight. Nicole comes out. A verbal, a verbal A verbal fight. fight. Got a little loud, and by that time, uh, uh, Nicole had come out, and we started having words about who is this guy, why is he here, what's going on. And, and she says, this is my house, get that the F out yeah, of here. Yes, and uh, which I didn't like because, once again, this is the same person, and if you read the book, you'll see some things that happened in the two weeks leading up to this that were uh, very, very irritating, you know. Uh, and I think Charlie had followed this guy in, one make sure it was no problem, and he brought the knife. As things got heated, uh, I just remember Nicole fell and hurt herself. And uh, this guy kind of got into a karate thing. And I said, well, you think you can kick my ass? And I remember I grabbed the knife. I do remember that portion, taking the knife from Charlie. And to be honest, after that, I don't remember. Except I'm standing there and there's all kind of stuff around and um, um, what kind of stuff? Blood and stuff around. You know, we. You know, I hate to say this, but this is not even that. Right, right. I know we got to back up again. Right. It's <laughs> okay. I want to back this up. This is hard. This is this hard. Is hard. To, yeah, I know. Yeah. I want to back it's up hard to, to try to make people think that I'm. A... <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Um, you wrote in the book, I had never seen so much blood in my life. Mm. Yes. Covered, you're covered. The scene, can you describe yeah, it? I, I, it's hard for me to describe it. I'm telling you, I don't think any two people could be um, murdered the way they were without everybody been covered in blood. And of course, I think we've all seen the grisly pictures after. So yeah, I think everything was covered. Would have been covered in blood. And what goes through your mind at a time like that? I don't know. It's like, uh, what happened? Mm -hmm. You write about removing a glove before taking the knife from Charlie. Uh, you know, I had no conscious uh, memory of doing that, but obviously I must have because they found a glove there. And blacking out. Have mm -hmm. you ever blacked out before? Not to my knowledge. No. No, of course. Uh, of course, if something like this would take place in anybody's life, if it were to happen, I would imagine it's something that you would probably automatically uh, have trouble wrapping your, your mind around it. It was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. Staggering first-hand details about the crime scene, which he says are hypothetical. You wrote in the book, I had never seen so much blood in my life. It's hard for me to describe it, I'm telling you. I don't think any two people could be uh, the way they were without everybody being covered in blood. Then you see bloody footprints and you decide to take off. Yes. Actually, I, I believe Charlie kept saying, we got to get out of here. And in the book, you describe taking off your shoes, your pants, and your shirt and dropping it in a bundle. Do you remember that? Uh, yes. And to remember what happened. Because what are you going to do with it? <laughs> you know, somebody's got to get rid of, uh, as you may have called during the trial, is that wear the bloody clothes. So somebody had to get rid of the bloody clothes. Right. And you had left your keys and wallet in your pants pocket and you had to go back and get it? You know, to be honest, uh, I think, I, I know that to be true, yes. Yes. Um, and Charlie is hysterical, sc screaming, Jesus Christ, RJ, Jesus Christ. And you tell him to yeah, shut up? Yeah, he's in a panic. He was in a panic. And I'm telling him to shut up. Let's get out of here. So you get back in the car 
You take in your clothes, put them yeah, in the bundle, and drove back and and that it parked a block away because I knew the limo would be there and came across the backyard through the two tennis courts and, you know, came through the house. So um, you went through the neighbors? Neighbors, yeah. He had a tennis court, then I had a tennis court. And you go into the house and what happens in the house? I, 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 I ran upstairs to take a shower. I actually ran upstairs and took some of my bags and came back downstairs and put them out front. Sickening, right? Sickening. See, I wish that they would have aired this back in 2006. This man literally sat there and did an interview admitting what he did. That was no hypothetical in that whatsoever. This man was speaking in first person, detailing how he did it and had no remorse, laughing about it. This was psychotic. Psychotic. The, like I said to y'all, the fact that he even wrote a book titled If I Did It was insanity to me. And the fact that Harper Collins published it was just insane. Insane. He was truly a psychotic person that needed to be maimed, okay? So ladies and men out there, if you are in abusive relationships, they do not get better. They get worse. So get out while you can. Because this didn't have to happen to this woman and this innocent man. This did not have to happen. Abuse always starts off, you know, with degrading comments, control, um, keeping you away from family and friends. Then it starts with the pushing and then you might get a slap and then it just goes into punches and kicks and everything else. And Nicole kept a diary of all of the abusive incidents that she was succumbed to when she was married to this man. And her sister said after her passing that Nicole knew that something was going to happen to her. And that's why she kept a diary of all of these incidents because this was the 90s. OJ was one of the biggest stars um, on the planet. You know, he was the juice. You know, he was all on our television screens, endorsing products in movies, you know, a football hall of famer or whatever, Heisman Trophy winner. He was the man. White people, black people looked up to him. They literally rode this man's dick. They dick ride him crazy. So even though she had photographic evidence, was calling the police on him, Nothing was done to him. He didn't go to jail. Nothing happened to him. Nothing. Nothing. This is one of her entries in her diary where she discussed the first time he laid hands on her. She wrote 1978, first time he beat me up after Louie and Nooney Merry anniversary party. Started on street corner of NYC, Fifth Avenue, at about C, threw me on floor, hit me, kicked me. We went to Sherry Netland Hotel where he continued to beat me for hours as I kept crawling for the door. Wow. Here is another incident that she wrote about. Hawaii gay man kissed Justin, that's her son, with OJ. OJ threw me against walls in our hotel and on the floor put bruises on my arms and back the window scarred me thought had threw me out so I'm guessing some gay man kissed Justin he got mad blamed her and decided to beat her mm, mm, mm. she wrote went to the hospital claimed it to be a bicycle accident this is just so sad. It really honestly is. It makes me want to cry. And this is actually a letter that she wrote to OJ. I don't know if she sent it to him or not, but this is what it said. 
OJ, I think I have to put this all in a letter. A lot of years ago, I used to do much better in a letter. I'm going to try it again now. I like you to keep this letter if we split so that you'll always know why we split. I'd also like you to keep it if we stay together as a reminder. Right now, I am so angry if I didn't know better that the courts would take Sydney and Justin away from me if I did this, I would fuck every guy, including some that you know, just to let you know how it feels. I wish someone could explain all this to me. I see our marriage as a huge mistake and you don't. I knew what went on in our relationship before we got married. I knew after six years that all the things I thought were going on were. All the things I gave into, all the I'm sorry for thinking that, I'm sorry for not believing you, I'm sorry for not trusting you, I made up with you. All the time and even took the blame many times for your cheating. I know this took place because we fought about it a lot and even discussed it before we got married with my family and a minister. Okay, before the marriage, I lived with it and dealt with, the next word is illegible, mainly because you finally said that we weren't married at the time. So basically, he was gaslighting her saying, we ain't even married, I can basically do what I want. I can see other women because we're not married yet. Mm, ain't that something? Now, remember when she met OJ Simpson, Nicole was only 18 years old and he was 30 years old. Let that marinate in your soul. She was a young, impressionable girl and he had a, no business even getting with her. He had already been married, already had children she didn't know what she was getting herself into. Oh my God. Now I do not know, and I could not find any information on it, but I don't know if there was any overlap of him being with Nicole while he was married to his first wife, Marguerite. I do not know, but um, yeah, let's continue on with this letter that she wrote to OJ. I assumed that your recurring nasty attitude and mean streak was to cover up your cheating and a general disrespect for women and a lack of manners. I remember a long time ago, a girlfriend of yours wrote you a letter. She said, well, you aren't married yet, so let's get together. Even she had the same idea of marriage as me. She believed that when you married, you wouldn't be going out anymore. Adultery is a very important thing to many people. It's one of the first 10 things I learned at Sunday school. You said it. The next word is illegible. Can't make it out with her handwriting. You said it. Some things you learned at school stick and the 10 commandments did. I wanted to be a wonderful wife. I believed you that it would finally be you and me against the world, that people would be envious or in awe of us because we stuck together. I'm sorry, because we stuck through it and finally became one, a real couple. I let my guard down. I thought it was finally going to be you and me. You wanted a baby. So you said, and I wanted a baby. Then with each pound, you were terrible. You gave me dirty looks of disgust, said mean things to me at times about my appearance, walked out on me and lied to me. I remember one day my mom said he actually thinks you can have a baby and not get fat. I gained 10 to 15 pounds more that I should have with Sydney. Well, that's by the book. Most women gain twice that. It's not like it was that much, but you made me feel so ugly. I've battled 10 pounds up and down the scale since I was 15, and it was no more extra weight than was normal for me to be up. I believe my mom, you thought a baby weighs seven pounds and the woman should gain seven pounds. I'd like to finally tell you that that's not the way it is. And had you read those books I got you on pregnancy, you may have known that. Well, girl, he did know that because he'd already had children prior to you. So the fact that he was making her feel bad about gaining weight, 
that was just a form of mental abuse and to make her feel unattractive and like nobody else would want her. He was already starting to plant those seeds and her being this young girl, what was she going to do? She didn't know any better. She just saw this black powerful man who was rich and he wanted her. And oh my God, he wants to have a family with me and get married. Mm. Talk about feeling alone. In between Sydney and Justin, you saw, you say my clothes bothered you, that my shoes were on the floor, that I bugged you. Wow, that's so terrible. Try, I had a low self-esteem because since we got married, I felt like the paragraph above. There was also that time before Justin and after few months, Sydney, I felt really good about how I got back into shape and we made out. You beat the holy hell out of me. And we lied at the x-ray lab and said, I fell off a bike. Remember? Great for my self-esteem. There are a number of other instances that I could talk about that made my marriage so wonderful, like the televised Clipper game and going to blank is illegible again before the game and your 40th birthday party and the week leading up to it. I don't like talking about the past. It depressed me. Then came the pregnancy with Justin and oh, how wonderful you treated me again. I remember swearing to God and myself that under no circumstances would I let you be in that delivery room. I hated you so much. And since Justin's birth and the mad New Year's Eve beat up, I just don't see how our stories compare. I was so bad because I wore sweats and left shoes around and didn't keep a perfect house or comb my hair the way you liked it or had dinner ready at the precise moment you walked through the door or that I just plain got on your nerves sometimes. I just don't see how that compares to infidelity, wife beating, verbal abuse. I just don't think everybody goes through this. And if I wanted to hurt you or had it in me to be any anything like the person you are, I would have done so after the blank incident, but I didn't even do it then. I called the cops to save my life, whether you believe it or not, but I didn't pursue anything after that. I didn't prosecute. Oh girl, you should have, you should have. I didn't call the press and I didn't make a big charade out of it. I waited for it to die down and asked for it to, but I've never loved you since or been the same. It made me take a look at my life with you, my wonderful life with the superstar, that wonderful man, OJ Simpson, the father of my kids, that husband of that terribly insecure blank, the girl with no self-esteem blank of worth. She must be blank. Those things too, with a guy like that. It certainly doesn't take a strong person to be like a guy like that. And certainly no one would be envious of that life. I agree. After we married, things change. We couldn't have house full of people like I used to have over and barbecue for because I had other responsibilities. I didn't want to go to a lot of events and I'd back down at the last minute on functions and trips. I admit I'm sorry. I just believe that a relationship is based on trust. And the last time I trusted you was at our wedding ceremony. It's just so hard for me to trust you again. Even though you say you're a different guy, that OJ Simpson guy brought me a lot of pain, heartache. I tried so hard with him. I wanted so to be a good wife, but he never gave me a chance. Wow. Like he should have been underneath the jail. And what's even sickening to me is that when the OJ trial was going on, I was a little girl. I was actually 14 years old when the trial began. And I remember just rooting for OJ because he was black. <laughs> and because he couldn't, he couldn't have done it. We all loved OJ. And, you know, my grandmother was alive still. And she was like, that man ain't do that. You know, we all had OJ's back because we did not want to see the justice system and the white man take down a prominent black man. He just could not have done it. Oh, how stupid and wrong we were. Like I said, with the evidence and things that we have now, the way we have, you know, all of this AI tech and, you know, all the technology that we have nowadays. And just with the evidence that I showed you from back then, he would have been underneath the jail, death penalty and everything 
else under the sun, child. It wouldn't even been a trial, first of all, if this would have happened today. And it's sad that a few years later, and with his weird, erratic behavior, we started to see, oh, that nigga did it. He did it. He did it. He did it. And then when he tried to steal his trophies and things back and went to jail and then the book and all the other weirdo things he's done throughout the years that when I got word of his passing a few days ago, I was like, oh, go to hell. Goodbye. I had no sympathy, no nothing or anything of him. And then I just still want to know, like, with his children seeing this interview now. Or did they even know about it then? How did they have a relationship with him? Knowing what he did to their mother. Just the abuse alone. I wouldn't have had no relationship with that nigga. None whatsoever. You would have never seen me, sir. Never. Ever. He could have rotten hell for all I cared. But yeah, people need to remember this when they get to RIP and, and uh, no, I hope he don't rest in peace. I hope he rests in hell, honey. I hope he don't have a peaceful night ever, okay? Because what that man did was just despicable on so many different levels. It's so sad what happened to this woman and this man, a senseless death because of an insecure, egomaniac, control freak that like to hit on girls. Then to make things even worse, a report from People Magazine came out today saying in the full legal document, O.J. Simpson's longtime lawyer, Malcolm Laverne was named as the executor of his estate with Simpson's son, Justin Simpson, being named as his successor. Malcolm, who the Las Vegas Review Journal notes has represented Simpson since 2009, told the outlet that he does not want the family of Ron Goldman to acquire money from the estate. It's my hope that the Goldmans get zero, nothing. Them specifically. Ain't that something? Ain't that something? So you know that that was of OJ's request. Obviously. Obviously. And no money is not going to bring their son back. But <laughs> this man is causing a ruckus from the grave. He is literally a spawn of Satan. On my Patreon, you guys, I have even more uh, photographic evidence and things. It is very graphic. Um, so if you want to see the raw and uncut version of this expose, head over to my Patreon to see it. The link is down below in the description box. Um, hopefully this will give some of you guys that have championed this man, praised this man, um and everything else, some type of clarity about who he really is. And I think that if you watch the Patreon version, it will open your eyes even more to not praise this man, lust after him, cheerlead for him, because this was a very sick individual. Thank you guys for watching this OJ expose. Please make sure to thumbs up this video, like, and subscribe, and hit that notification bell button. I love you guys, and I'll see you on the next video. Bye.